As I was informed, the, the most interest, you know, here maybe uh, really at, at adaptive designs, at the exploratory stage, and then uh, on the adaptive enrichment design, I will spend most time on that. I will just uh, bring several cases where adaptive design has already been used uh, and, and resulted in approvals uh, at the confirmatory stage of development. Um, so let me begin with the with the exploratory stage. Um, some things that uh, should be outlined here is um, first is something that is something that is you know, not always recognized, and that is the, the the value of design. You know, you hear so often, you know, okay, well uh, somebody has a molecule, and that molecule is going to do in drug development what it's going to do. However, the, the value of that molecule depends on the dose or regimen that is given. It depends on the population to which it is going to be administered. And even the sample size, you know, has an impact on this because it has an, an, an impact on, on, on the probability of, of approval or probability of, you know, technical success. So typical adaptive phase two designs, um, Pyron has given a more detailed overview of that, but the whole idea is you start with a larger number of doses, and then you have usually multiple inter analysis. And after each uh, inter analysis, based on the data that you observed in pre-specified algorithm, um, you're switching more and more towards the most the doses that are performing the best. So, so this adaptive algorithm is, is discontinuing some doses along the way that are not uh, performing well and focusing on the ones that are most promising. Uh, it, is, it, is, it, is, it has been demonstrated repeatedly in simulation studies that generally these types of adaptive designs are the most efficient approach for this stage of development uh, because of its flexibility. Now, this is not something that what I described here is not something that is done in oncology. In oncology, you usually don't study multiple doses. Um, what is usually done in oncology is um, you go in, 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 in phase one, uh, you, you, uh, you study the, uh, the, 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 um, the, the highest, you look for the highest tolerated dose. And uh, these studies of a limited, a limited, a limited sample size, and as a result of that, there is really a limited, you know, level of confidence whether you really have the maximum tolerated dose or not. Nevertheless, you depend on this dose for the rest of your uh, development. Um, then, what is usually done in the phase two, and I'm not saying always, but what is usually or traditionally done in the phase two, only one dose and with, with a single regimen is taken into that dose. You usually have uh, that stage. It usually looks like, like a mini phase three trial. It's really just another checkpoint whether you should go into larger phase three or not. And what usually happens in phase three in oncology is the drug fails. Uh, and that is because it uh, really has never given a fair chance to um, you know, get through uh, development. Uh, the, the, uh, the success rate in, in oncology is really, really low, particularly when it comes to phase three. So maybe something can be learned from phase from uh, from how phase two is done in, in other in other therapeutic areas. You know, I'll, I'll try to, to, to draw the parallel. Um, phase two generally is 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 the stage where you can optimize your drug development because the best dose gives you. I mean, if you select a good dose, that dose gives you a better chance for for success for regulatory success. It gives you a better chance for differentiation after approval. So uh, really, uh, you know, it, it's really worth you know. Uh, investing a little more into uh, into this stage of development, in some way, and all this uh, this brings you know a number of you know relatively complex scenarios that one one can uh, or or can best uh, compare uh, by, by by running simulations. So, given that we actually we, we've done many of these uh, studies and and when we when we do this we look at at, at the late stage development as a whole. We usually don't look at this at a trial by trial basis. So what you see up here, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, so what you see up here, it's really um, uh, a case study from, from a different indication. This was not done in oncology. I'll try to, to make a parallel here. So what is done uh, usually in, in other indications, you start with some with your POC studies, and then after that you go with a dose finding study where you're, where you're testing a number of doses, and then uh, if needed uh, if needed you go to definitive dose response. Now for that may or may not be uh, the exact need in, in oncology, uh, given that all that you have at this stage is, is usually the maximum tolerated dose. 
However, what you can be doing here is you can be studying multiple indications, or you can be studying multiple regimens, or if you have combination therapy, then you have a whole grid of possible combinations of two uh, drugs, so you can study multiple combinations. Uh, what would be consistent with this graph is that, that such study, so if, if, you're, if you're studying multiple of something, let's say multiple indications, that can be combined with, uh, by the means of an adaptive design in, in a single study where you, um, you know, select the, 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 the most promising indication or the best regimen, and then you do the POC in the same study. Then, well, sometimes you would go into definitive dose response. That's probably not something that you would be doing in oncology. Uh, but what could be done uh, at the next stage is something like this. Well, let's say after this point, you still have one or two candidate indications, or you have one or two um, uh, regimens. Well, you can combine these in one study, where after interim analysis, you select, you select one regimen, and then at the second stage of the trial, um, you, you demonstrate efficacy uh, uh, with selected you know, regimen and, and the control. Uh, as I said, in oncology, sometimes you actually end up having only one dose in the phase two. And for something like that, there is absolutely no need uh, to go with separate studies. It's actually, we, we run simulations. And if you combine these, um, it's much more efficient to do phase two and three uh, in one study because you're not doing anything else but really just having another checkpoint and you can do that by the means of an additional interim analysis. As it turns out, you save a lot of in time of development, certainly in cost, and as it turns out, you, you, you actually have much better probability of success because you're using the same patients for two objectives, so it's, it's a lot more efficient in any way. So we, we calculated, so we, we looked into some scenarios and often, often the expected net present value would more than double if you decide uh, to, to combine um, two trials. OK, so that much about phase two. Uh, I, I did try to make an analogy and, and try, to, try to, to, to you know, put oncology in the context that phase two is done in, in, other, in other therapeutic areas. Confirmatory stage, um, there are three main types of, of adaptive designs at the confirmatory stage. Um, and they all address some, some remaining uncertainties, you know, as you come to, into the phase three. As, as well as you do your, your exploratory stage of development, you still have, have some questions. Unblinded sample size reassessment, uh, if you still have uncertainty about the treatment effect, and in oncology you, you almost always do because your endpoint in phase three is usually your overall survival and you just don't have time to have robust data on overall survival prior to getting into phase three. So this is one way of, of of uh, the risking your de uh, drug development in the phase three. At an interim analysis, you're assessing whether sample size, your, your initial sample size was la large enough to assure the proper power. This is something that they explain. Two-stage design used to be called seamless phase two three design. You still have some doubts about what is the best dose, uh, but uh, uh, so, so you go, we go with a couple of them at an interim analysis, you decide on the best one, proceed into the second stage, and you can use the data from both stages. You just need to adjust for multiplicity for a type 1 error because you have been looking at a couple of doses. And then you have two stage with that design with uh, subpopulation selection, and this is something that I will be talking about a little more. This is a little more novel design. It came just a little later than these two. These two have been used a little earlier than this one in general. But here you start, you, you still don't know if, 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 if your, if your subpopulation is really sufficiently better than, than the whole population in terms of efficacy, say. So you're giving yourself another shot, and I will describe exactly how you do, uh, to do that in the phase three by, by the means of, of, of making the decision at an interim analysis. So uh, the, the, the very last slide before I, before I um, get into, into that case study, um, two approvals, uh, this one based on an unblinded sample size reassessment drug approved in 2013, single uh, trial, uh, two stage, so seamless phase to three uh, design, single uh, pivotal trial resulted in an approval of, of a product in 2012. So these are, st these are studies designed by Cetel a number of years ago. 
So uh, if anybody tells you that we don't have success stories of adaptive trials at the confirmatory stage, uh, yes, they are. These are just some examples of studies that we designed uh, in-house uh, at CITEL. So focus on adaptive enrichment design. It has been communicated to me that this may be of, of this type of design may be of the greatest interest. So uh, I'll go quickly over one um, case study. <clears throat> So firstly, uh, predictive en enrichment, that is the identification of patients who are more likely to, re to respond to a given treatment, the treatment under development. So this is exactly a type of enrichment is usually of interest to drug developers. Uh, then adaptive enrichment design is the type of, type of design that validates predictive marker and confirms efficacy within the single trial. So at the, at, 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 at the beginning of the trial, you have some signal of, of you have some signal that uh, the biomarker population may be doing better, and I will illustrate why you need that signal. Um, and then, and then, but you're not certain about it. Uh, first, let's look at some impacts of, of, of enriching. Um, um, first, in terms of labeling, the FDA, there is, there is a drug guidance that has been published um, late in 2012, I think December 2012, and that guidance states that use of predictive enrichment will usually lead to indication directed at the predictive enrichment, enrichment population. That means that label is limited to your biomarker population. So from this perspective, this may not look appealing, you know, in terms of the, the, the population size uh, commercially. However, however, uh, you know, uh, during, during the development, and particularly with help of that enrichment, uh, adaptive enrichment design, you're going to differentiate better. So there is a better chance that you can get regulatory approval because you have more robust efficacy for that subpopulation. Um, even more so, you should consider payers. Uh, even if you get, uh, even if you get uh, your drug approved, this is going to be reimbursed. Uh, what is going to be the value of your drug on the market? And obviously, uh, adaptive enrichment gives you that chance to to, to uh, a better chance for, for a differentiated product. Uh, so be it for a subpopulation, uh, but nevertheless, a better chance for for uh, differentiation. Um, just thinking of how your 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 you know phase two three um, development path may look when it comes to to uh, biomarkers. First, just for the, for the simplicity, so that I can put this in one graph. You know, let's say let, let's assume that we, we are down to one sing, single candidate biomarker. So you may have these uh, these uh, <coughs> scenarios. When you look at the whole population, if the results are negative in your phase two trials, and you can you can be very adaptive here because these results are not a part of your confirmatory evidence. Well, you can still look into you can still look into subpopulations, particularly, you know, if you have pre-specified the, the subpopulation of interest, you don't want to have spurious finding by, by, by looking, you know, uh, at, at subpopulations in a post hoc manner. So if, if you have negative results in, in your whole population, you can still look at your uh, biomarker subpopulation. If that is also negative, then you may as well stop development. But if your finding is that the enriched population actually is giving you a good signal, that may be a reason to initiate a phase three trial in this population only, and then you would regulate um, uh, enrichment really by the protocol, uh, by intrusion criteria. Um, or if the results in the whole population are positive, and then you look, um, um, you look, you look at, at, bi at pre-specified biomarker population after that. Well, the biomarker subpopulation is doing approximately equally well as, as the whole population, you're probably going to stick with the whole population. There is no reason to, you know, to subset your population any further. However, if, the, if uh, results in, in biomarker subpopulation are clearly better, then you would do something similar as here, and that is you would go into phase three with enriched population up front. So you would just, just regulate the protocol. Well. But how about you have a signal, and it's a great area where the signal is. Um, I think this is this is best decided by running simulations and seeing what different, what various differentiation in biomarker population may give you. But your biomarker subpopulation is doing slightly better than the full population, and there is you think that there is a reason you should take another look whether you should enrich or not. Then you can go with an adaptive enrichment design. Um, Decision criteria still, 
in the interest of time, I may want to skip something of this, but uh, still you have questions, you know, how you're going to design your, your adaptive design and, and, and how you're going to, to, to set your, your, your decision criteria. You may want to go after the full population first, even in this adaptive design, and only if you fail there, you go after biomarker subpopulation. Or your indications are good enough that you just want to focus on biomarker subpopulation first. It, it's just a way of, of, of setting your, your, your decision criteria in different ways. Uh, what is commonly actually <laughs> the motivation for sponsors to go with, uh, with enrichment, uh, and, and I'm, not, I'm sure many regulators would not be uh, pleased with this, is really uh, looking into biomarker population one more time is just another way to salvage a trial. So you give yourself another chance to uh, get your approval. Question, is there a benefit from selecting subpopulation at interim? I mean, you can have all these decision criteria right at the end of the trial itself. And then you have more data and you can make the, make the decision better. And finally, general consideration regarding the benefits to complementary. There are some ethical questions there that are actually very well described in the guidance itself. So I will not go into details, uh, uh, details there. But this is really just something to consider, uh, uh, some ethical questions when it comes to, to uh, these trials. So this is a setup. We enroll subjects from the full population, and we stratify, by the, uh, we stratify the randomization by the biomarker parameter, biomarker positive or biomarker negative. We have an interim analysis. In this particular study, we were fortunate to actually that, that the final endpoint was expected to be PFS, and we, we use the same point for the interim analysis. You have three zones. Uh, at interim analysis, you look at, at, at the full population first. This is how we, we set up this decision criteria. If, you, um, if the chance that that study is not going to be successful as a whole is, is really minimal, then you just close the study for futility. Uh, the, the, the criteria here was used uh, that was used was is conditional power. Very easy to explain what is that based on the data observed thus far. What is the probability that we are going to have a positive study in the end? So if the conditional if the conditional power is less than say 10%. We may as well close the trial. However, if the conditional power for the full population is, say, greater than 80%, then you just may continue the study as it goes with the full population, and these are the only analysis that you do. Now, if results are inconclusive, let's say between 10% and 80%, for example, now you want to consider whether you should enrich or not. And then you compare your your your, your <coughs> biomarker subpopulation, conditional power with a conditional power of full population. Or you can compare conditional power of subpopulation to conditional power of complement population. And if that is greater than cert certain percent, let's say 20 percent, then you decide to enrich. If not, then you just continue the study um, as it goes and, and you do the analysis on the full population because there is no reason to enrich. Uh, the subpopulation is not doing sufficiently better. Um, here are some, some simulations that we ran for, for this particular case study that, um, that I was describing. I, I will describe two scenarios. One scenario is uh, the drug as a whole is working, but that is pretty much driven by, by uh, the biomarker subpopulation. The hazard ratio is 0.5, so almost twice as good as, 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 as the control. But, but complementary subgroup is just slightly better than, than. So what you get here in terms of the overall power, you get 6% improvement, 87% with enriched study. And if you didn't go with an adaptive enrichment trial, you would have 81%. So 6% overall. However, if your results fall into the enrichment zone, then you get 31% improvement. The only problem with this particular, the, the, the only reason that you gain only 6% here, you have 25% chance to, to fall into this enrichment zone. There are two reasons for that. Uh, I will explain one right now. Given that overall efficacy was good, most often we fall into this favorable zone. And that is why there is a little less left you know, for enrichment zone. There is another reason that I will show show to you after the next slide, and and I'm and I'm getting close to um, 
the end of my presentation. Well, here's a situation where you actually have very good efficacy, 0.667, hazard ratio 0.667. That is the same in, in the biomarkers of the uh, cell population and complementary group. Well, then actually you lose power if you go with an enriched, uh, adaptive enrichment trial. And the reason for that is you need to control for alpha. So you're losing, you're losing power there. Um, but the reason, the reason that, that um, we had only 25% here, you can see on this slide, in this slide, we actually have only 4% chance of falling into enrichment zone. And if you include fertility analysis as well, then you get only 2% chance of falling here. So the, the, the thing here is, and you have all the options, you should be considering a number of options, but here we wanted to protect against enriching in situations where you should not be enriching. So you end up you know, with very small percentage here, with a relatively small percentage here. And the, the way that was controlled was with this selection of this Y here. So obviously, we selected a relatively large Y here because we wanted, you know, we didn't want to, to have an error on the side of enriching when you shouldn't. If you go with smaller, with smaller Y here, then you may get slightly better, slightly more difference in power here, but not that good result here. So in the summary, adaptive designs are making drug development more efficient. Uh, simulations are necessary you know, to evaluate options. And I would say they should be necessary for evaluating options, whether you, you're using an adaptive design or not. Numerous products have already been approved based on adaptive uh, design trials. And adaptive enrichment uh, is an appealing option um, uh, in, in oncology uh, uh, development at the confirmatory stage from ethical, POS, and commercial perspective. And these are just selected references. Thank you very much.